part of that judgment declared that the NAS was not an investigative journalist, but rather, quote, an investigative terrorist. So what does this mean for the practice of investigative journalism? We connect journalists, lawyers, citizens, home and abroad to explore. You are live on Joy 99.7 FM, back on air and hopefully to stay. My name is Evan Spence and this is Ghana Connect. It was a bombshell judgment this week that potentially could redefine the contrast of investigative journalism in Ghana. The High Court's verdict on defamation uh, case brought by investigative journalist Anas Arimeya Anas against MP Kennedy Japan. Part of the judgment declared that Anas was not an investigative journalist, but rather, quote, an investigative terrorist. The key question remains, what does this mean for the practice of investigative journalists? or investigative journalism. Anas Arimeya Anas himself has addressed the issue in a video he posted today and serve notice he will be appealing. Hello everyone, I want to use this opportunity to thank you all for the calls, the messages and voice notes of solidarity and support over the past 24 hours. I am truly, truly grateful. Although the news about the dismissal of our defamation suit against the member of parliament was unexpected. I disagree with the judge's reasoning, both on law and the facts. When I started this line of work 22 years ago, I never assumed it would be an easy road. Yet, it is the evidence in my work and the commitment to truth and justice that has always led and prevailed against all the forces that have worked to pull us down. My team and I remain unwavering, despite the attacks on us from the death of Ahmed to the constant threats on our lives. We remain guided by the principles of fairness, integrity, and courage as we continue our investigation in the public interest. My team of lawyers and I have carefully studied the judgment delivered by the court, and we are unanimous that the judge made an overreach and descended into the arena and made criminal pronouncement about me as if I was standing a criminal trial. He also justified the MP accusing me of the murder of the late J.B. Dangwa, murder of 20 Chinese nationals and a host of other crimes. We are filing an appeal because there was no evidence provided. Last year, we also filed another defamation action against the MP in the United States where he made similar defamatory statements against me. The case is ongoing. As a student and practitioner, I strongly believe in the rule of law. That's why I initiated the action in the first place. The fight continues so we can create a just society for ourselves and the next generation. We will continue to build for God and country. Nothing will stop us from fighting corruption for Mother Ghana. And that's Anas Aremi Anas himself there. The central question we are attempting to answer tonight is, so what does this mean for the practice of investigative journalism? There's a whole debate about um, the, the judgment itself, and uh, we'll get time to get into that as my connectors uh, connect with me, both in the studio and on the phone lines. Uh, lawyer Ni Bakpo Ado uh, connects with us on the phone. Hello, Ni. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, wonderful. Uh, viewers and listeners uh, for doing. Thank you very much and uh, grateful that you are connect uh, with us. Uh, Manasseh Zuria Wuni uh, is an investigative journalist himself. We also connect on the phone. Uh, on the phone. Hello, Manasseh. Hello, Evans. Great to have you, Manasseh. Uh, in the studio with me uh, uh, tonight is Francisca Encho, an investigative journalist also. Hello, Francisca. Hello, Evans. Hi, Francesca. Thank you for connecting. Uh, we'll be connecting to Raymond Acha, uh, another ace investigative journalist, a uh, publisher of the Enquirer newspaper. Uh, we'll connect on the phone. Uh, Worship Riafe Frimpon is the president of the Gimpa Law Students Association, also uh, connects uh, in the studio. Uh, before we get into the, the, the views of everybody else who's connecting tonight, and I, I want this conversation to flow, so I'll be, I'll be, you, you'll hear me very, very minimally in the conversation because this is one of those very interesting subjects that we need to discuss a seminal case by all definitions so for those of you who haven't who don't know about this judgment what, what is it really in summary uh joseph akabla is our court correspondent is on the line with me right now he'll give us a brief summary uh for the benefit of those who haven't followed and then i'll get my connectors to chip in joseph so give us a summary then well, what was it what was it that the judge said that has taken social media in this country by storm 
And so, for those who may not know what this case is about, it's a case in which the investigative journalist Anas Arimi Anas sued the MP Kennedy on Hine Japan. Uh, Anas had alleged that the MP defamed him by calling him a murderer, criminal, thief, corrupt person, extortionist, among others. Uh, he wanted payment of 25 million cities as damages as a result of these defamatory comments. Uh, the court, after uh, uh, the case had been filed, determined that the main issues for determination uh, were as follows. The first is whether or not the words which the defendant, that is an, uh, Kennedy Japan, had caused to be published were in their natural and ordinary meanings uh, considered to be defamatory to the plaintiff. And so that was a substantive issue. And whether the defendant, that is Kennedy Japan, was justified in publishing and or causing to be published the words that were set out in the documents that are now filed in court. Uh, now, the ruling of the court, uh, the court found that the evidence on record showed that Anas had self-confessed to committing the crime of bribery, corruption, and being an extortionist. Uh, part of the judgment where the court says, quote, such conduct is legally and morally wrong. It is evil. Based on the evidence, the defendant was justified in calling the plaintiff evil, criminal, corrupt, blackmailer, and extortionist. Since the contents of exhibit KA01 has been established to be true and factual, all comments made by the defendant based on in relation to this is justified and fair, end quote. Uh, another allegation that has been very crucial and critical has to do with the allegation that uh, Anas Aimi Anas a former member of parliament, Joseph Bratchett Dankwa, and in that instance of Anas, he played a short while ago. He made reference to it. Now, the court noted that Kennedy Japan and the cross examination that he said so because Anas had alleged that he had killed Ahmed Swali. Uh, the court said that the hypothetical reader would have read about a notorious case involving the murder of the former member of parliament, uh, Mr. Bwache Danko, and would be aware that the trial of the suspect does not include Anas Arimi Anas. Uh, the allegation made by Kennedy Japan could thus not succeed in actually defaming the plaintiff. On the allegation of land grabbing, uh, the court said it also could equally not succeed in defaming him because he had made reference and cited a court judgment which the court said was consistent with it. Uh, the other issue that is worth talking about very briefly is the video uh, that was the court relied on. I mean, it's a video that uh, Mr. Japan made available to the court. It was published before the documentary Who Watches the Watchman. And in that particular video, according to the court analysis, uh, there was a, it was a thing that concluded first and foremost whether Anas was indeed in the video or not. But the court said that it appeared the witness statements and causes of nation of Anas attorney, the person who represented him in this particular matter in court, it appeared that in one breath they were claiming that he was the one in the video and in another breath he was claiming he wasn't the one. But eventually the court took the view that it appears the content of that video and the commentary indeed led you to believe that he was the one in that particular uh, video. And so it's a video where the court says that uh, he's had one in an engagement with a prosecutor where uh, his Team had, I explained that it was a case of a pre-trial discussion, a pre-trial conference. The court said that discussions were had about uh, some bribe that had been paid, and the prosecutor had asked uh, how much had been transferred to her, and uh, how much again was it was said that some amount was paid to a senior police officer as well. And so that is that video that the court made a commentary about in the event that uh, the court saying that it amounts to a self-confession. But then again, the judge went on to uh, engage in what some uh, lawyers and jurors will call orbiter, making comments which the court itself knew that it was not a, a case of making specific rules of law, stating rules of law on, but commentary that it was making anyways. And it bordered on the practice of journalism. And reference was made to the CNN and the BBC as to whether it will employ the services of someone to engage in what the judge says, targeting of high-profile individuals, uh, with the aim of causing the affection of them or ridiculing them in the public domain and raising questions about well, how such a motion will even be funded. Uh, he says the journalist in question is a journalist and a lawyer, and he is not sure that that risk of dollars in the quantity that you have access to in order to be engaging in such entrapment. And so if there is sponsorship, then what is the intention of the sponsors? And if the target is the president, for instance, it could mean that it could be... Um, triggered by individuals who do not like the president or contested against him and lost and will be make available funds for it to be used in such a manner just to cause public disaffection. 
And so in summary, that is what the decision was about. Evan. Interesting, Joseph. Thank you very much. And that last bit, Joseph, describes the, the judges bringing in the work of CNN, etc. It, it, it lays out serious implications for our practice. And now that it's the judgment of the court, anybody can cite it. Uh, thankfully, I have Nick Papo with me on the phone. Uh, Ni, uh, so you are a, a, a lawyer. Um, and I know you, if I'm not mistaken, you represented uh, a, one of the judges who was I have represented four of them. Four of them uh, who yeah. were caught up in one of uh, Anas's investiga investigations yeah. in the past. So f first tell me, where do you stand on, on this debate on the back of the of the judgment? So, <coughs> um, oh, your name again, I always... Evans. Evans. Evans, yeah. okay, Evans. The first thing, you, you see, so that we are guided in this our discussion. Um, are we are we going to be strictly looking at the judgment, or are we then are we also allowed to express our personal opinions alongside the judgment, so that I'm careful when I'm expressing my personal opinion and when I am dealing or critiquing the judgment? Because in, in fact, because this is going to connect, you are you are allowed to take it where you, where your convictions lay. Okay, excellent. So let's take it from there, because you see. There's been a lot of commentary on this particular judgment based on matters that are not dealing with the issues at stake in the judgment. You understand? And it is quite unfair if you are analyzing a judgment when you don't take the issues that were before the court and how the court went about dealing with or resolving each particular issue. Because you see, Parties go to court with their claims. The court sets down issues for determination. So matters that are not in controversy, the court will not bother itself. Okay? It is normally after the court has finished evaluating the evidence and applying both the evidence and the facts that the court that the court comes to a determination. That the court comes to a determination and then that product is what we call the judgment, and then you go on appeal. And normally, when you are going on appeal, you are going on appeal specifically in respect of, of matters that, if you are appealing in your consideration, there were specific pieces of evidence that the court did not take into account when, when making a determination of what was before it. But normally, the appellate court will not interfere with findings of fact, okay, except where there was a gross miscarriage of justice or where the court did not take certain vital pieces of evidence into account. Now, there has been an ongoing debate as to whether what uh, Mr. Anand's practices were what he called investigative journalism, whether it constitutes investigative journalism or whether it constitutes entrapment. I have always been of the opinion, and I've argued it all the way to the Ecowas Court of um, Court of Justice, that what he did in respect of the um, uh, the judge's case constituted a breach of the privacy of the judges and did not fall under the exceptions that journalists are. You know that there are exceptions, so that if, for example, you to, to prevent the commission of a crime then even though your, your rights may have been breached, that is your right to privacy may be breached, the court will consider it as being a necessary evil, okay, for the larger good of the society. So, in the case of the judges, for example, when we go to the court, court, the court was opinion that, yes, there was a breach of privacy, but for the fact that the, the, the evidence in question was being used, being used, being used, being used to... Um, deal with the prevention of corruption on the judiciary, they were going to make that exception. Now, if you come to this case, I also remember that Mr. Anand has been also using the, the vehicle of the courts to justify his work. You understand? And he has had cases go for him, and sometimes the courts may not rule entirely for him, but they also say that, well, to some extent, you've crossed the lines here or you've done A or done B. But at the end of the day, he has subjected his work or his work has been subjected to judicial scrutiny. 
And when he has been victorious, or when he has been held, some people have suffered. So, for example, people have lost their jobs. People have been prosecuted. You understand? So, in the same breath, he must also then be prepared that when he has, and remember, he went to court. He was the uh, plaintiff in this particular case. He went to court. That's where you, we all need to be a bit fair to the judgment that was delivered by the court. He went to court and made specific allegations against the defendant who is a member of parliament. In essence, if you look at, and this can be found on page 3 of the judgment, his complaint bordered on the fact that the defendant had alleged that he was a thief, that he was an evil and dishonest person, that He's a fraudster, he's an extortionist, he's a blackmailer, he's corrupt, he corrupts public officers, he was engaged in a number of things. So in essence, he was a criminal. <laughs> now, the defendant, in his defense, said that, yes, I have said all the things that you have said, but I am justified because what I am saying is the truth. So, if that is the case, the law is that he who says that what he's saying is the truth, that is Mr. Kennedy Adepo, must adduce evidence in court in support of the allegation. So the court then cut down the issues. And then, you see, this was a case where this judge, and, and if, you look, if you read the introductory part of the judgment, he said that this judgment was a monumental one because the issues at play and the individuals in, involved meant that we had to take the time and evaluate every single piece of evidence in accordance with our judicial standard. Yeah, and even, I, 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 I want the other connections to come in. So I want to land on okay. your main point on the first uh, preliminary comments, and I'll get others to come in. What, what, what would you say okay. on the back so, of the see, controversy? There was this, to his and you see, the major evidence, and that's what I wanted to focus on, that's one of the things your journalist also stated. There was one crucial piece of evidence, which was what? The... Uh, uh, the, the video uh, that the video the watch, was a uh, who watches the watchman. Do you understand? Critically, people don't remember that or don't take into account the finding of fact by the judge that that piece of evidence was actually filmed by Mr. Anas himself. That piece of evidence was not filmed by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Kennedy Japan. Kennedy Japan. Although he procured it. He procured it. And the point is this. You are talking about, and one of the criticisms that uh, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Anas was putting up was the fact that he was saying that the video was a, a combination of um, videos, you understand, and that there were voiceovers inside. I found that very funny. And the judge also made that point, that you did not bring your original copy. Because if you say that that video was doctored, where was the original copy that will show that this video was doctored? Because you had a duty. You don't deny that you are the author of the video. You say it is doctored, and that there were voice authors among others. Everybody who is familiar with Anasis work knows that he also does voice over. And we have also, when we were dealing with cases involving him, and other lawyers and other persons who also challenge the fact that those documents, I'm, not, I'm sure if you look at from Charles Bishu to what have you, they all complain that there the, 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 the were, the, the were voiceovers and that they are challenging the authenticity of the, of the videos. Now in the court of law, the rules on evidence are clear. If you say that the video in question was a doctored video, where was the original? Anas has not complained that he produced an original video which was different from what was in court. And the court denied him the opportunity of playing it or putting it in evidence. Mm, so bottom line, you, you're, you're with the judge when he describes his work as investigative terrorist. Terrorism. Okay. And as a, as a lawyer, if I read the judgment based on my years of experience, I find it difficult to see any particular piece of evidence that Anas sought to tender his evidence which was rejected or which was not evaluated. And I'm sure somebody will point out to me a particular piece of evidence that he sought to tender in 
and the court refused it. Okay. Uh, Nee, stay with me. Uh, let me bring in the other connectors uh, now. Um, and Manasseh is an investigative journalist to all come to the studio where I have two uh, views also represented. Manasseh, you, you have written on this, and you say uh, judicial terrorism versus investigative uh, terrorism. Oh, what did you mean? Hello? Yes, Manasseh, can you hear me? Can you repeat the question? Yes, I mean, you, you wrote about this, and you, you're, you, you titled it <laughs> Judicial Terrorism versus Investigative Terrorism. What did you mean? Yes, basically, I think that uh, going through the judgment, I think the judge could have done better. I think the judge went beyond uh, what he was supposed to say. And uh, with regards to specific inst uh, the instance I cited, that even in the process leading up to this day, or a day of the judgment, we know, and it has not been disputed, that one judge was sitting on the matter. That judge was transferred. And then an interim judge was appointed to take over the case or handle until a substantive judge was appointed. Now, when a substantive judge was appointed, Kennedy Japan and his team requested that the interim judge should come back and handle the case. He did this without copying the plaintiff and his team. And when the chief justice also re responded and assigned or asked that judge to go back and continue the case, the other side didn't know about it. And if you look at proceedings, the judge said that Anas and his team ought to have known about what was happening, both the petition and the chief justice's response. So in the first place, if I'm in court with you, Evans, and then I decide that I want a particular judge to come back and continue the case, and then at the end of the day, my wish is granted without the other party knowing. The other party only got to know when they went to court and the judge was uh, there. Uh, Evans, can I have a quick bite at this particular? Uh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Let me, I want, let me. I want, I want, I want, it's I want a very this. important no, point. No, 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 just hold on because oh, I want to. I know. I want others to have their bike. Then we'll come. We'll come back around. I want to be a debate, but let everybody else have a quick say first. Manasseh, some have justified it. Some have justified it. It is done, but uh, there is this uh, axiom in law. I'm not a lawyer, but we all know when lawyers say that justice should not only be done, but it must be seen to be done. Yeah. So let me address and, even. Just just hold on for me. Stay on, make a note, and we'll come back to that. The matter. I read it, and what I understand the judge saying is that because the, med the alleged murderer suspect has already been arrested, and then it is out there in the public, a hypothetical reader would know that it isn't an who committed a murder. So that cannot be said to be defamatory. And I'm arguing that if you go out there, even though someone has been arrested in relation to that murder, there is overwhelming public opinion that the so-called sexy don-don who goes to court and sometimes they report very funny things did not ask anyone. So for me, I do not agree with the judge on that score so these and others are some of the issues i raised in that article i wrote today that i think reading through the judgment a few things could have been done or said better and if you look at that evidence that piece of evidence that they are talking about when i watched the uh, who watches the work i realized that some of the videos were indeed up and the, there are questions about it. At the time, when I made some argument in some quarters, as he argued, uh, some people said that, well, Anas does it to people. So if Kennedy Japan also does it to him, then it is a fair deal because he also does voice overs and doctors and all of that. But I felt that in the court of law, 
I think that video could have been interrogated further. And I don't know whose responsibility it was to produce the original. And, 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 and in this case, from what I understand, it was Anassis because he challenged exactly. it. So Anas no. should have provided, and when, he was when, uh, he when, didn't deny when, that he when, should. In shot the it. past, when Anas went to court, when Anas went to court, and then the people challenged, Anas was asked to produce the original videos in the past. So if Anas records Charles Bissell and Charles Bissell goes to court and said this is doctored, the responsibility is on the one who tended in that video to go and bring the original one. No, is that true? Think that is not correct. Somebody, I don't think the court would tell Charles Bissell to go and bring the original one. In this case, there is a bit of a nuance or difference because Anas is alleged to have recorded this video. But now that the video is in the custody of someone else, it is possible that a video could have been uh, lost or stolen. I am not saying that's what happened, but these are possibilities. A joy, my, uh, my, my, my hard drive ever got lost when I was working there. So if someone takes that video and does anything to it, and it goes to court, and the court wants me to go and produce the original video, that will not be fair because I have Ow. lost the video, even though I recorded it. So all of these are possibilities. So we shouldn't just say that, well, because he recorded it, it is his responsibility to bring the original if he doubted it. Because if I should record you, Evans, or if we should go to court, and then you, Evans, challenge the video, the court will not say who chal whoever challenges the video should bring the original one. So I want us to open up the discussion so that it doesn't uh, seem like, okay, because A did this, he must do this or that. But generally, I think I have also listened to, I'm not a lawyer, I've listened and read from some lawyers, and they feel that there is something a bit wrong with that judgment. Okay, yeah, I think, so two views they expressed about this case. Um, I want to come to the studio, uh, take, take it slightly away from the legal matters, and, and come to the implications really and francisca um I, so when you first saw it when you first saw the judgment what, what hit you because you are an investigative journalist yourself i, I, I want to understand the thought processes that went through as you started reading around what was happening to anas i was shocked okay and confused <laughs> why you know it each part i read at every point i get more confused because i wasn't getting how some comments were being made in relation to the defamatory suit because going into the person's mode of operation how the person does his work and then how some tapes end up not coming out in final documentaries pertaining to a defamatory suit i i just didn't get how that was relating and so at a point i got confused as to how the the, the ruling ended up in that manner and, and it, it was quite disappointing. It, I think some of these things, maybe we need to have a serious public discourse on it. Because with investigative journalism, it seems a lot of people are, under, are misunderstanding how we work and why um, some tapes they expect to see in documentaries end up not appearing in the final documentary. Possibly because if an investigative journalist investigates a number of people, at the end of the day, before the, the documentary comes out, definitely we are required by law to give everybody involved in our, doc our investigative reports fair hearing. So definitely, after our investigation, we've, we, the person will contact a couple of people who are involved in the, in, the, in the findings for response. And so possibly, once you know that you were contacted by this particular investigative uh, journalist, on a particular issue he, he or she had investigated and you were asked to respond and so you are expecting to see yourself or even if not you but someone you know has told you that this investigative journalist has contacted me over an investigation he's done and it involves me and simply because that friend has told you that and you were expecting to see that friend in the final documentary and the documentary comes and that friend is not in it you assume that the person has been bribed or to, to, to cut that part of the story out of it. The fact that we investigated six institutions 
and contacted six people to interview them. Does not mean that the, the, the moment we bring out the documentary, you should see all six institutions or six persons interviewed in the documentary. We have basis, different reasons why we drop some tips when we are producing our documentaries. I don't think there's any investigative journalist in the world who has ever done an investigation and at the end of the day, the documentary comes out and every single tip was published. Because, let's be fair, if an investigative journalist investigates something for three years, continuously for three years, you know, the, 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 the size of the tips captured within these three years. Obviously, when you are producing a documentary, you can't have all that tape in the documentary because you can't even have uh, up to one hour long documentary. In this very case, there is a certain Baba Tunde who exactly. um, is, is head in the video. I mean, I think somebody said in the video, I think a nurse said in one of the videos suggesting that he had brought him $100,000. Exactly. The judge then does an analysis and says, um, because the Baba Tunde wasn't in the final product, it sort of then makes the point that it's true that if the allegation of, of bribery is, has, has actually occurred. That's, that's not accurate. Just as I, I don't have that legal knowledge to, to make conclusive statements about the work of the judge, I think he shouldn't also make conclusive statements about investigative journalism because clearly he doesn't understand our practice. The fact that the final tip didn't have Babatunde in it doesn't mean Babatunde paid for his tape to be cut out. So many reasons goes into the decision for an investigative journalist to sit down and watch all his tapes and decide, okay, let me cut this out. Let me bring this. Let me leave this out. So many reasons goes into it. But that doesn't change your view if you uh, pay attention to the judge's reason for that conclusion, being that in this video, mm -hmm. Anas has had himself allegedly saying that this Baba Tunde had, um, quote, bought him with a hundred thousand dollars and then the judge says i didn't see but out today in the final product so then that comment in the video is, is proven so you know there are some instances where you can actually go and investigate something and during your investigation you set out your gadgets and all that and you can go come back home you know a particular event took place mm. which you can perfectly narrate but then you go home you put your gadget you connect your gadget to to uh, gather your tips you realize you don't have the tip we have gadget failures sometimes so it is possible that an, an, a particular event took place which you can categorically speak to because it's a fact it took place but then it is likely that your your your, your gadgets failed you you could not capture a video but that doesn't mean that that event didn't happen okay but that's an investigative journalist view there let, let, let me bring in let me bring in uh, worship, w worship. So, uh, mm. I know you've, you've sat quietly listening to the debate. Mm. It's quite a, a, an intense one. Well, where do you stand on this? Well, I think that um, I agree with many when they say that this case is a rather sensitive one involving um, personalities who have varied reputations and popularity. And I, I'm a bit worried that we are rather simplifying it to make it look like. You know, there's um, some sort of ganging up against Anas in this process. Just like Ni mentioned, there's been a few other court instances where Anas himself has benefited from the ruling of the court. And so we should always be on that, you know, premise that the court is actually the final impartial arbiter of justice. Now, I, I would want to respond um, swiftly with... Um, Francisca's issue and then I'll continue well, sure, to sure, sure. that Manasi. You know, the, there's, there's a difference between an orbiter dictum, right, and then the ratio decision die. Normally in court, the passing comments that do not directly relate to the case that the judge would make um, in the process of elaborating on the case are called orbiter dictums and they are not, hold, they are not held within the court's ruling. So they do not form part of the principal ruling of the court. The ratio dissidenda would directly be the principles of law that a judge will make in support of the explanations that he has given. And we need to really pay attention to the case actually in court and what transpired than moving away from court to talk about things that perhaps were not in court. And as, as a lawyer himself, and he's, an, he's a journalist, he places him within you know, the center of the two issues that are happening. And he is aware that 
in civil suits, the primary bed, the primary, you know, uh, um, burden of proof always rests on the person who is making a vehement to provide evidences in support of that vehement that they are reasonable beyond doubt. And once you provide that su sufficient evidence, then that, you know, um, burden moves away to the defendant to also provide evidence in rebuttal. These are captured within under section 14 of the Act 3, I mean, 323, three, three, and then section 10.2. And so, if Manasseh makes the argument that um, because Kennedy brought the video and then Anas did not, you know, respond to it in any form or provide the original video, the burden is not on him, then it's wrong. If Kennedy has been able to provide that bedding, it shifts from him to you to also provide so that a ruling will not be made against you. And if indeed you agree that you are in the video and it was a rehearsal, you've admitted to the scenes inside there. Then it's, the burden is on you to actually pr prove that indeed this was a rehearsal. And so this cannot form part. These are two separate videos. They're mutually exclusive. But if you don't provide a reason and you don't provide the actual video, then the judge will find that particular exhibit authentic. That, that is really the, the premise of the, uh, the argument. If somebody says that Evans has done this and I bring a video in support of that and Evans says that no, this was something, with, it was a funny comment, then it would rest on Evans to actually, you know, provide. So it's not really about I have shot a video and there's a certain part I decide to bring out or not. This is something that has been tended in by the defen defendant as evidence to why he made those statements as basis of justification. So you would have to actually provide it, like I'm saying, under the two sections, the onus of the, bed, the, the primary burden of proof will shift from him to you. And you'd realize that a judge found that the other exhibits, you know, KO2, KO3, KO4, he says that were fair comments because once there's been a decision on the actual murder case and there's been a corporate found, then we cannot really, you know, direct, you know, assess the impact. Then the right thinking members of society will assume that it can be you. It can be you. It can be you. And, that, and you see, the judge is a trial of fact. The judge that has that discretion, looking at all the facts laid before him, to say that, okay, these ones indeed ha go a long way to damage the reputation of you. Assuming that there had not been a decision, and we've not found, we've not reached a final conclusion on who the, med the murderer is, then we can sustain the argument that in the absence of that, then that statement was defamatory because we still don't know who did it. It means that there could be a probability. People will start looking at you and us rather as the murderer when the case is actually in court. But he has not been sentenced. But there's been a conclusion. Once it, there's been a conclusion, he and us himself cannot be you know, a victim of that defamatory statement. Th those are the arguments in court. No. And, and, and you'd realize that, you'd realize that, you'd realize that there were a few questions that the, the judge asked. Francisca, you disagree? Uh, I disagree. I Why? Mean, I, let me just hear. Why? But until he's proven guilty, has, has the guy been proven guilty? He's not been proving it as I speak. He, he's still a suspect in the case. And so if somebody makes an allegation that I murdered that the man, if I made it, if somebody makes an allegation that I made it J.B. Damkwa, although there's somebody in custody, that person has not been found guilty yet. It means it is likely that I also have a hand in it. So you can't say that simply because somebody is in custody over a murder, an accusation leveled against me about the same murder can't be injurious to me. Mm. That's not a fair statement. Well, you, you see, Evans, you see, Evans, we, we need to take the statements of the judge in light of the analysis that he made. That the defendant in question indicated that I made these particular statements prior to this particular case. And the judge is making the analysis, making the assessment that that particular case actually has beyond a primary suspect in custody, beyond a primary suspect. And because we have a beyond a primary suspect, would need to move away from actually weighing and balancing the impact of the of the defamation that you sought. I mean, you sought to claim that you're a victim of. That that is it. I mean, weighing and balancing the the impact of the defamatory is what we are looking at. And 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 you should be you should be um, very much very much worried about the prior. I mean, the primary incidents in court. So that, like I'm saying, we'd not drift away. And then be talking about any other thing that may may not really be relating directly to why well, I agree that some of the statements um, of the judge may have carried you know wild emotions and may sort of 
you know appear as though there was a manhunt in the whole case mm -hmm. but 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 those are not actually contained in the principal ruling that's what i'm saying i i, I get i get your distinction you're trying to make so, so, like, i want to have move this conversation I, we've talked about the legalities of it it's, it's okay but uh, let's have the let's talk about the implication of the judgment mm -hmm. really um and 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 francis i want to come to you on this if you read the judgment the judge made six serious you know pronouncements about the practice of and a Nazis approach right where he gives out money and people are you know and the, i read it and there's, a, there's a verdict that he he sort of delivers that says that practice is i think it's it, it, it says it's bribery <laughs> you know and Anas himself has engaged in bribery you, you saw that right you saw that in it. You have, you, you have yeah. read that part? Yeah, 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 I read that part. Yeah. I mean, so that in itself, in the judge is already saying that that way of doing investigative journalism mm -hmm. is wrong. Right? Yeah. You, you are a lawyer. You tell me mm -hmm. this. Can this then have a long lasting implication of the way journalists have done this, mm -hmm. this uses practice for a long time mm -hmm. elsewhere in the, in the mm -hmm. world? Is this a, a definite pronouncement on whether or not that then becomes mm -hmm. one that you can practice mm -hmm. any long for a journalist going forward? Can somebody go inside that and say, if some if say francisca tomorrow decides to use that mode to you know get information mm -hmm. how will this ju judgment affect her, her work well i agree that it's it sets a precedent that has a a heavier in, you know implication on the duties and then the work of journalists but i mean that's a relative precedent that's a relative precedent the argument in the court of public opinion really is that there, it's a 50 50 thing there could be truly the instance that the victims in this situation were entrapped. There could be also an instance that these victims in the situations were actually not entrapped, but they are actually culprits of the situation. So, I mean, we, we, we would not necessarily have to look at it that it is fully impeding the progress of the work of journalists. It would rather mean that in the course of their work, in the course of their jurisdiction, they would need to, you know, um, ensure that their work is sufficient enough so that people would not have, you know, people will not be skeptical about the things they are doing because this is really not the first time that people are being so much worried about the modus operandi of an ass. It's not been the first time, it will not be the last. It's always been happening and then people are worried. You know, people that are not even journalists are worried about it. That really, I mean, you, you put a, a cheese in front of <laughs> a, a rat and then you expect that it wouldn't bite it. It's, it's, a, it's a different thing altogether. So do you, do you so, see this judgment then as a definite pronouncement of a court now that that way of doing investigative journalism is illegal? Well, it, it, I mean, is that is mm. cons can that can can you have a reasonable interpretation of that to mean that? I mean, pursuant to the principle of stare decisis, when a higher court, you know, um, like the high court, Supreme Court, make a judgment, normally becomes you know binding on the lower courts to to follow. Then again, I mean, this is issue of defamatory, and then it will definitely re come back to the higher court, and so it no, may no, be no, resting. It may be resting. No, 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 no forget about. <laughs> we have not gone there yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is the judgment mm -hmm. in front of us. That's what mm -hmm. we are working with today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking you uh -huh. from the judgment, uh -huh. the judge's pronouncements uh -huh. on the pr on the practice of uh -huh. the uh -huh. analysis uh -huh. procedure uh -huh. as of today. Yeah. Does it deliver a mm -hmm. verdict on mm -hmm. the legality or otherwise of that of that mm -hmm. procedure? of that mode of mm -hmm. gathering information through his work it does but not absolutely it may be a basis for referral no, no, no. for reference i mean okay exactly yes it may be basis for reference but it's not absolute that once it's been decided this way that the, the next court that will sit on it would no no i get it i forget about the next yeah. court being. i'm talking yeah. about acid. it hasn't mm -hmm. been appealed right yeah. so yeah, we're I mean, yes, with yes, what we have not, today not, so as yeah. of today yeah. Yeah. if a, a, if mm -hmm. she decides mm -hmm. to come and bribe me as a public officer <laughs> and films me and mm -hmm. I go to court mm -hmm. and I cite this one mm -hmm. because he hasn't been set aside mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. That practice, there's a huge question exactly. legally around it now. I agree with you. What do you say to that? I agree with you. Evans, when we are working on mm -hmm. investigative reports, if it has to do with an individual, we profile you. We, we do profile you. And if it is money that I, I, I have to use before I can get to you and get the evidence that I need, it means the profiling has proven that getting access to you is through money. You can profile somebody mm -hmm. and getting access to the person is through women. You can do that. Mm -hmm. 
And so when I profile you, and the, my, the only way I can get through to you is money, it's, it's been confirmed. So many people have testified that you, you are corrupt. When I give you money, I'll get you. Investigative journalism is expensive. So then I, I, is a the judge then trying to imply that money shouldn't be involved in investigative journalism anymore? First of all, whether you say you've been induced or entrapped, whatever it is, it's relative. It's, it's based on what you see as entrapment. Well, yeah. But then when you are, you are saying that you've been entrapped, were, were your hands lifted to accept the entrapment? Were, were you held to the ground to accept the entrapment? If you are not corrupt and somebody mm. is, is bribing you, you will not accept it. Mm. You will not accept it. And so when somebody comes, because I'm investigating something, I learned you take bribe to offer this service. And I come and give you the bribe. To get the service, mm. how do we call it entrapment? So it's it's relative, mm. but then the ad, in the nutshell is if you are not corrupt, and I profile you and I get to know, I can only have access to you through money, and I bring the money and you tell me get out of my office. Why are you trying to bribe me? <laughs> what happens then? No, that's an interesting <laughs> point. I mean, but, but the judge makes a point, and I think uh, Blay makes the point that so what if? the motive for doing that because every human being we, everybody has your flaw mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so you say you've identified my flaw mm -hmm. and you're coming to deliberately uh, go you know, to that give me the thing that you now establish every human being has you do everybody so i find you isn't there something a bit investigative journalists don't just get up and mm -hmm. walk to evans i'm going to bribe evans there should be a lead okay you should have established a hypothesis before mm -hmm. you set out like a judge who you've had exactly in, you know, it is because some people have come to you to tell you the course of justice yeah. i had a case this judge it. was in charge of it and at the end of the day i don't have money i realize the other person is rich and i understand the person mm. went to meet the judge gave the judge money mm. and then the ruling went in favor of the person we have such things to set a hypothesis before we set out to investigate we don't just sit down and then look at you and say you are too handsome let me bring money and come in and trap you <laughs> there should be a basis okay to set very off. interesting manasseh let me quickly come to you and i'll come to neo so i know he's been dying to say a lot manasseh quickly the, on on that on the implications of this i know you've read it you are an investigator journalist as well you read this does it encumber your work or you think you, you're still free on the back of this to do it as you please not at all and in this regard i would want to disagree slightly with francisca in a sense that in this work i think it's beyond the judgment we investigative journalists should also accept this this scrutiny as something positive so that we clean how we do our work then revise i do not think that the judge talks about any exchange of money at all. Okay? And it isn't correct to say that because you have not forced the person to take the money, it cannot be said to be entrapment. Let me use an example. Anas did a fantastic job on the biscuit contaminated flour that was used to produce biscuits. In this case, he went and observed and captured the evidence. If he had put the maggots in the flour and then waited to see whether the company would still go ahead and use it to produce, if the company went ahead and used it to produce and he recorded it as evidence, that in my view would have been wrong, even if the company was not supposed to have done that. I'm saying this because money in hands is not enough proof that someone is corrupt. I have told my reporters that when you are doing an investigation and money has to change hands, never, never hand over money until it is demanded. Mm. And in the recording, it must that show clearly the phone has been put on hold. Demanding the money to do the something has been put on hold. Illegal. So it isn't just have enough have to say that well, I mean, very because the person has taken the money, the person is corrupt. Somebody can be given a gift. And the fact that the gift is recorded doesn't mean that the person is corrupt. So what I'm trying to say is the that... The call has been put on hold. Hello, hello Manasseh. Yes. Please proceed. What I'm, yes, what I'm trying to say is that I don't see what the judge has done 
as impediment in the way of investigative journalists. It is true that some people say there's entrapment when there's no entrapment. In other times, too, you can see clear entrapment in the works of investigative journalists across the world. So my point is, let us go out there and do our work. Let us be transparent. Let us not betray the trust that the public has put on us. And when we are dealing with others, let's ask ourselves, if this was done to me, would I have liked it? So that at the end of the day, we can do our work and go home to sleep soundly with clean conscience. So that I don't sincerely believe that what the judge said will mean that we shouldn't use money to do investigation. But if you go to Nsawan prisons and then you hear allegations that some prison officers are taking money to buy drugs for the inmates, and then you go and then you hand over ten thousand dollars. That if you're able to give this back to an inmate, you get ten thousand dollars. In this case, the amount of money involved may be so irresistible that someone who is in the habit of selling drugs may be tempted to do it. I will call it entrapment. So when we come to the exchange of money, it is a very delicate issue, but I sincerely believe that we can still continue to do our work. And I don't think the judge in that aspect is talking generally about exchange of money. You can never rule it out. But we, there, there are ethics guiding every profession. And when it comes to undercover investigation, including where there's supposed to be money, as I've stated, don't give until it is demanded. And not every money that changes hands means that someone is corrupt. No. Francisca, I want to have you... Yeah. The, the fact that I, I spoke about uh, saying entrapment being relative doesn't mean I support entrapment. I think I've said it on enough platforms that I am against entrapment of any nature. If you pick any investigative report I've done, you realize I always use participatory strategy in my investigations. I go through the process. I go, if the thing is happening, if this is the issue, I go through it, and you can check every report of mine. I am against entrapment, and I've said it severally. However, and everything that Manasseh said, yeah, it's true, it's possible that uh, uh, something that somebody is going through at a particular moment or whatever might somehow influence the person to accept a bribe or whatever. But what I'm saying is, if you do not believe in accepting bribes if it is a principle you can't be entrapped to accept it although i am against entrapping anybody it is fair to do participatory investigations capture your evidence live as it happens and bring the raw evidence out when you bring it out nobody can come out and scream i've been entrapped i've been entrapped because the evidence is clear so just that that the fact that somebody presumably entrapped you doesn't justify why you accepted it interesting let me get the two lawyers views now before i wrap up be, be, you you second but let me go to Neen. hello Neen. yes so that, now you have your turn that, please go yes let's go quickly with some issues that were raised. this issue of judge change okay i can tell you when we did the judge's case okay there was a case we found in kumasi against Anna from showing the, the video at the Golden Chili Hotel. The matter was transferred to Accra, right? Uh -huh. And a single judge had almost all the matters that we were dealing with when it came to Anna. Would you say that because that is at the request of a particular party, it means that, that, that the judge is saving somebody? If Anna had any problem with the particular judge in question, he knew what processes to activate. He can bring an application for recusal, and the judge would rule on it, just as we've seen in uh, 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 case. And so nobody can say that the judge had a special interest. That, that is a very unfair attack on the integrity of the judge. If the report has uh, captured at you, can the judge possibly said, this is the judge that had had a portion of the evidence. And obviously, if he's heard a portion of the evidence, why shouldn't he hear the entire case? And why should the new person come? 
the three thousand was with them say, hey, if you are a party or you disagree, and be the lawyer, he will stop you too. So that is just a red hair being thrown in to just discuss what happened. On the issue of voice to them, okay? The judge, and this is at page 43, uh, 44, and I think I, I, I keep pleading that people should take their time, and if you want us to do an exhaustive show on this one, I think you should create a forum for us to come and sit down and take the judgment and take it piece by piece. The judge said, announced in his witness statement and statement of case, used voiceovers to try and explain the context of some of his statements. And so if you are using voiceovers in your witness statement and your statement of case, why should the defendant be allowed to use voiceovers? It is just a matter of fairness. If you use it, the defendant had a right to use it. What you have is to cross-examine the uh, uh, translator who did the voiceovers in the sense of translation. And he had the opportunity. He had the opportunity. In fact, you know, the most critical piece of evidence was the issue of the voice, uh, the video recording, which the two recordings that made up the uh, who watches the watchman. Those recordings, the recording in the office of the uh, state prosecutor was done by the Saban. Indeed, if he had another tape which said that the thing was doctored, this is because this is not the first time announced engaged in these kinds of trials. He always brings what he calls the original rush, the original. So if you get, if you believe that that particular tape was doctored, Anand has the expertise because he has he has video editors, he edits his videos and all that. He could have called an expert. So clearly the judge had a lot of legal basis for coming to the conclusions that he came to. Future of uh, investigative journalism there must be standardization. And I'm happy that uh, Manasseh is stating the fact that the principle, the cardinal principle should be if what you are doing, okay, you are subjected to the same standard, will you survive? And that was one of the cardinal things that the, uh, what do you call it, the judge sought to point out. That Manasseh's mantra is name, shame, and jail. When he shows videos about people in the public and the recordings, what he says is that we should take the recordings and the contents of the recordings for what they are. The people don't get the opportunity to come and say that those videos are doctored and what have you. And then he what, what, how, what forum does he give those people the opportunity to counter the videos that he did? The same principle was applied to him in this case. What the court said, you have been seen in a video making what we call judicial confession. This is a video that you recorded. So on what basis are we not also as a court? not to accept the, 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 the recordings and the statements that you made in it. If you say in the video that you have been, you have been compromised by a particular person to the tune of $100,000, why should we not accept that as a judicial confession? Because that it is in their case. You have recorded it. All the people that are now have, you have gone after in the past. What has been his, 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 his basis? That question and take said this on the video. That Charles Bishop said that on the video. That Charles Bishop put uh, uh, money on the table. So if me yourself also on the video, is caught saying that I received a hundred thousand dollars and I gave seventy thousand dollars to this person. That's why you say that you say the court should not take that into account, but that you are practicing a rehearsal and the rehearsal be a come on. Read the judgment. I think that this judge took his time, wrote a judgment, evaluated evidence. If you disagree, yes, he has a right to go on appeal. But until an appellate court turns out, overturns this particular decision, it remains findings of fact. Mm. And it's just unfortunate. As much as we may all admire an act, and sometimes people should distinguish between a critique of his work and a critique of his person. This is a critique of his work. And a court, just as the same courts have upheld portions of his work, when the court said that in this particular instance, based on the evidence available to the court, this is what the court findings are. We should learn to respect the court decision as well. Okay. Uh, Yafe? Well, so I, I think I generally agree with Manasi on that particular stretch. I was indicating prior to his statement that, indeed, you know, motive may not be um, too much of an essential element, right? But in our legal system, it is allowed for us to find out whether or not the motive for which the action happened was, I mean, the intent was to induce the party in question 
or generally because you have already heard that this person has the tendencies of doing this or offering that's this that's the reason why you're going because if i understand that someone is a criminal like a proper criminal someone who robs the bank and then i get closer to him and i'm like i mean my friend today there was no money do you think we should rob the bank and the person says yeah i, I think we should go and do it at the point in time you didn't go and you did not directly hear from the person first of the person's you know i mean character or traits you actually mentioned it and it induced the person in the process and so it is really a time that i mean in a call that investigative journalists would look at how they are carrying out their work so that people wouldn't really question the motive behind the, the, the i mean their task that they are carrying out so that people would genuinely you know still hold them that if i mean even our courts are failing us we can still trust investigative journalists to bring out the real details of the question but if we have to always question the motive that you have and that you have to use huge sums of money i mean in the conversation with people and tell okay so what we we should give you this amount of money right and the person takes it and you say that okay the person actually has the tendency and so whether or not there are circumstances of entrapment it does not matter and manasseh lays out a very interesting principle that don't offer the money if it has not been demanded until it's demanded and it's a very important principle and i think that all other investigative journalists including my friend my francisca she doesn't disagree <laughs> manasseh i, I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Manasseh, manasseh himself yeah. we were on the same platform yeah. last saturday okay and he cited an example of mm. when we do stories and people try to bribe you to drop the story and so he cited a, a, a situation where he was he went somewhere and then he was being offered money mm. huge sum of money and he refused to take the money the person used so many stories to try to coerce him to accept the money he refused to accept it at the end of the day he walked out there boldly without accepting and still did the, the story money. Yeah. and then still did his story and when he went later on he got he got to know that there were uh, uh, state security people had been planted to arrest him had he accepted the money okay so he was being he was being entrapped right the money was being forced he was being coerced yeah. to accept money i, I see where you're going he with had this. principle and so he refused to accept it and he walked out with his dignity intact yeah, if, if manasseh may reject them i mean manasseh if you give manasseh uh fertility and akbalan <laughs> <laughs> which i know he likes maybe he might have eaten that <laughs> hello manasseh is, hello. You know, I, 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 i'm sure you might have eaten the fertility if that was the one that came your way can you hear me? I can, yes. Yes. What I'm still insisting is that uh, what Francisca said is true, and the security man who was supposed to lead the arrest said this in the presence of Mr. Anakomia. But I still insist that uh, the fact that I didn't take the money doesn't mean that if somebody takes it under those circumstances that I was offered, the person cannot say he or she was entrapped. So when people say they were entrapped, uh, I hear people say, if you, are, if you are a vegetarian and they offer you meat, why should you? I think it is wrong. We journalists have a responsibility to be fair, honest, and transparent with the people we deal with. So I will never under any circumstances say that because I didn't take it. I expect others not to take it. The responsibility is on me to ensure that I do not coerce somebody. I do not entice somebody. I do not give money. The call has been put on hold. Please wait. And sometimes, and sometimes even taking the money isn't enough. What they claim they want to do, you should follow it through to get to the bottom of the story. So I will insist that as we go forward as investigative journalists, I do not agree with some aspects of this judgment. I do not agree with some of the attacks on Anas, but I sincerely believe that this scrutiny is good for the next generation of investigative journalists. Okay, and Anas, I think that's a, a fantastic way to wrap this all up. Let me take final comment from both of you, yeah, Riafe and then uh, Francisca. Well, uh, um, 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 Evans, I think that um, we would really need to move away from thinking that the issue or whatever transpired in court is a um, a cause in manhunting a particular person or a particular personality we need to actually take the instances and then the evidences that were tended in in court and look at it and wait and see that okay in analyzing this thing truly 
was the person you know complicit or the person was not complicit was it grounds for defamatory or was not grounds for defamatory if we look at it that way we'll be taking the issues that happened rather than taking the personalities and saying that one i mean the whole thing that happened is is attacking i mean a particular personality or i mean one person in there we should just look at the issues that really happened and look at what the precedent set like mm. you mentioned and then look at it from two other stretches so that we advise that regardless of this particular precedent there's still responsibility on any other court so that would listen to any case like this that is being done by our investigative journal to look at it well and not say that because this one has already has been set as a precedent it means it applies in all okay. circumstances Francisca, i mean yeah. was it was a big thing for you on the back of everything that has happened on, the, on, on this judgment yeah so i think i i'll have to side with uh, manasi on this uh, no matter what it is from the different angles and the different issues that have come up i think it's a, it's a lesson to everybody because we we have young ones who aspire to be investigative journalists and they they have cases of this nature to cite and know that uh, entrapment this is what it can do to you at the end of the day these attacks on your image and all that can happen as as a result of that and for them to know better which strategies to use and they have others to look on to as to how they, even Anas himself has done stories in the past where he was commended highly but then unfortunately for some time now he does stories and people have reasons to cite and try uh, entrapment in it so it's a lesson it's 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 something that everybody can learn from but then i feel we wouldn't be having all this discussion if we had the church has stayed on the issue if he had and not, not run gone, the commentary that exactly if he had not made run those commentary those commentaries might not have actually had any effect on the judgment in the first place but then those commentaries have raised the issue of you attacking somebody's personality and having the view of you judging in a particular manner because of certain perceptions you have about a particular person so had he stayed on the issue i don't think we would have had uh, this debate in the first place so we are looking forward to what happens next he says he he's wants going to appeal. appeal this yes and i think it's going to be a very interesting thing i think the whole of this country will be yeah, interested we'll that. to know exactly what happens in, in, in thank in you very much francisca thank you uh Riafe. thank you and me and manasseh a few of you on social media uh on facebook jody says people forget that even in respect of the judges some refuse the bribes we are dead as a people it is a revenge of the corrupt uh venerable nathaniel nati francisca uh he says it's not pleasing pleasing goodness and righteousness at all uh, Venerable says, uh, well, and a few of you on uh, WhatsApp also uh, shared your thoughts on this. And uh, I know many of you are, are interested in this. Charles says, if Anas had the responsibility of proving that the tape had been doctored, why did the court prevent the EC chair from entering a doc to prove that the figures you declared over the MPP were inaccurate? Yeah, tries the Ghanaian to bring in straight MPP and DC politics into a conversation about journalism. Uh, Sam Banama in the U.S. says the words the judge used on the NAS were harsh, but in other, on the other hand, uh, it, it's, it's uh, one that NAS should consider because it's a method or style of investigations as journalists. It's, he says it's uh, unprofessional, is his view, and Manasseh has said his, uh, his take on this as well. Thank you all for connecting, and I know this debate will continue until that uh, appeal is decided.